Hello and welcome to part 3 of the Fully Differential Amplifier series. In this video, we will analyze an FDA's open loop gain and noise gain and how these factors affect the amplifier's stability. We will also study how to simulate these parameters in SPICE using TINA TI. We will begin with a brief refresh of control loop theory. The generic design of a negative feedback loop for a control system is shown here. A represents the system's open loop gain in the forward direction, while beta represents the reverse transfer function of the feedback path. V in and V out are the system's inputs and outputs respectively, while Vx is the fraction of the system's output that is fed back to its input. Equation 1 can be derived by observing the system's forward transfer function and is simply the definition of A. Equation 2 is derived by observing the system's reverse transfer function and once again is simply the definition of beta. Substituting the value of Vx from equation 2 back into equation 1, we get equation 3 which after further simplification gives the system's closed loop gain. We will next see how this model can be applied to a fully differential amplifier. The open loop gain or AOL of any amplifier is the ratio of its differential output to its differential input when no feedback is applied. And FDA's open loop gain is the gain of the feed-forward amplifier. Just like an ideal op-amp, an ideal FDA will have infinite open loop gain across an infinite bandwidth. The open loop gain and phase curves of the THS 4541 are shown here. It has a very high AOL at low frequencies which decreases at 20 dB per decade after the dominant pole. Gain bandwidth product is a vital figure of merit of an amplifier's speed. The faster an amplifier, the higher its gain bandwidth product. An amplifier's gain bandwidth product can be estimated from its open loop gain curve by measuring the AOL at high gains. In this case, the AOL measures around 8.5 MHz at a gain of 40 dB resulting in a gain bandwidth product of 850 MHz. The higher the AOL at any given frequency, the more ideal the amplifier behaves. It is for this reason that a high precision ADC with a 1 mega sample per second sampling rate should be driven by an amplifier with a bandwidth of at least 10 to 100 times the sampling rate. Other factors remaining constant. Decreased open loop gain leads directly to an increase in an amplifier's nonlinearity and distortion. The control theory equations from the previous slide are repeated here. The forward gain of the system A has been replaced by the feed forward amplifier's open loop gain. The amplifier's feedback factor, beta, will be discussed on the subsequent slide. Similar to single-ended op-amps, the inverse of the amplifier's feedback factor, or 1 over beta, is also called the noise gain. An amplifier's signal gain is defined as the ratio of the magnitude of its output signal to its input signal. An FDA's signal gain is equal to the ratio of its feedback resistance RF to its gain resistance RG. The feedback factor is calculated by finding the fraction of the output signal that is fed back to the amplifier's input. In the case of a balanced FDA, the feedback factors for each half of the differential amplifier are equal. The feedback factor is then calculated using simple resistor divider math as shown here. 
An amplifier's noise gain is defined as the inverse of the feedback factor, or 1 over beta. The noise gain for the FDA configuration shown here is thus 1 plus RF over RG. This scenario is similar to an inverting op-amp where the signal gain is minus RF over RG and the noise gain is 1 plus RF over RG. An FDA in a signal gain of 1 where RF is equal to RG will be in a noise gain of 2. The term AOL times beta is called the loop gain and is an important factor when determining the phase margin and stability of the op-amp or FDA. A SPICE simulator such as TINA TI is very useful in determining an amplifier's stability. In order to properly simulate circuits, it is important to be able to extract the parameters that affect it. The main factors affecting amplifier stability are the open loop gain or AOL, the feedback factor beta and the amplifier's open loop output impedance typically represented by ZOL. We will now briefly discuss how to extract some of these parameters from the amplifier's SPICE macro model. The circuit shown here is used to extract the AOL of an FDA. The THS 4551 has been used in this example. The sub-circuit shown here is used to convert the single-ended input to a differential output. The method used to extract the AOL of an FDA is very similar to that used for single-ended op-amps. The large value inductors create a stable closed loop circuit at DC which is necessary for the simulator to converge on a stable operating point. The inductors become open at frequencies greater than a few hertz which is what allows the amplifier to be simulated in an open loop environment. The capacitors on the other hand are open at DC but become a short at frequencies greater than a few hertz. This configuration allows the differential source to directly drive the amplifier's inputs. Note that the large inductors and capacitors used in this circuit are only feasible in a simulation environment and cannot be realized practically. Since the feedback loop is open and the source directly drives the inputs, the signal measured at the output is simply the input signal multiplied by the open loop gain of the amplifier. Running an AC frequency response analysis directly gives the amplifier's open loop magnitude and phase shown here. The simulated results match the datasheet graphs closely. Ignore the low frequency behavior of the simulated response. It is an artifact of the model and doesn't affect the amplifier's performance above a few hundred hertz. We will now study the loop gain of an amplifier and learn why it is vital in determining an amplifier's stability. The closed loop transfer function of an amplifier is repeated here. When the magnitude of the loop gain equals 1 and its phase shift is 180 degrees, the denominator becomes 0 and the loop is thus unstable. The loop gain is best analyzed with the help of Bode plots. The open loop gain of an amplifier is shown here in red. The amplifier's low frequency AOL is 120 dB and it has a dominant pole at 1 kHz with a second non-dominant pole at 2 GHz. The amplifier is configured in a signal gain of 1 which in the case of an FDA is a noise gain of 2 or 6 dB. The noise gain is shown here in green. The noise gain is purely resistive so there is no phase change across frequency. The loop gain shown in blue is the difference between the AOL and 1 over beta curves. The equation relating loop gain in the linear domain to AOL and 1 over beta on a dB scale is shown here. 
the intersection between the AOL and noise gain curves is called the loop gain crossover point and is the frequency at which the loop gain magnitude becomes 1. The phase is then measured at the loop gain crossover frequency. The phase margin is the difference between the measured phase and 180 degrees. For a Butterworth response, the phase margin should be 64 degrees. The closer the phase margin is to 0 degrees, the less stable the amplifier. Here I demonstrate how to simulate the loop gain of a fully differential amplifier using TINA TI. The TINA circuit setup to measure the loop gain of the THS 4551 in a signal gain of 1 is shown here. An amplifier's output impedance will interact with the output load which in turn affects its open loop gain. So it is important to include the output load in the loop gain simulation as shown here. At DC, the isolation inductors are a short and the capacitors are an open, allowing the simulator to converge on a stable operating point in a closed loop configuration. When setting up a simulation using large series capacitors, ensure that all nodes connected to the capacitor have a path to ground to allow the simulator to converge on a stable operating point. The two 1 giga ohm resistors serve this purpose and ensure that the two voltage controlled voltage sources have a finite path to ground. At frequencies greater than a few hertz, the isolation capacitors will act as a short circuit and the inductors will act as an open circuit, thereby opening up the amplifier loop. The differential signal measured at the amplifier output is the amplifier's open loop gain. A fraction of the output signal is fed back to the amplifier's inputs through the feedback and gain resistors. The signal measured between nodes V in plus and V in minus is the amplifier's differential loop gain. R diff and C diff are the amplifier's differential input impedance specified in the data sheet and reinserted here since the inductors isolate the feedback loop from the amplifier's actual inputs. The amplifier's input impedance will affect its loop gain and therefore should be included back into the simulation. The loop gain crossover point is the frequency where the loop gain magnitude equals 0 dB and occurs at 65 MHz in this circuit configuration. The phase at 65 MHz is then measured and subtracted from 180 degrees to find the phase margin. The simulated phase margin of the circuit is 45 degrees. This method of analyzing the loop gain is critical when designing circuits. Similar to an inverting amplifier, a fully differential amplifier may be configured as an attenuator when Rg is greater than Rf. In such scenarios, the noise gain is still greater than 1 since noise gain is equal to 1 plus Rf over Rg. Many wideband amplifiers have secondary non-dominant poles very close to the point where AOL crosses 0 dB. Such amplifiers will have very low phase margin when configured in low gains or as attenuators. The AOL response of the THS 4551 exhibits this behavior as shown here. The THS 4551's loop gain response shows that it has a phase margin close to 0 degrees when configured in a noise gain of 0 dB. One way of estimating an amplifier's phase margin in any gain configuration is by checking the amount of peaking in its small signal frequency response. As expected, the THS 4551 shows almost 6 dB of peaking when configured as an attenuator in a gain of 0.1. Frequency response peaking exceeding 3 dB 
indicates a phase margin less than 42 degrees and should generally be avoided. Some amplifiers are inherently designed to be stable only in higher gains. Such amplifiers are called decompensated amplifiers. Both single-ended and fully differential amplifiers may be designed as decompensated amplifiers. The LMH5401 is one such example of a decompensated amplifier and is designed to be used in a linear gain of 4 or higher. The small signal frequency response of the LMH5401 is shown here. Notice that there is about 2.5 dB of peaking in a gain of 4. Lower gains will have higher peaking and thus lower phase margin. While the LMH5401 is designed to be stable in a gain of 4 or above, it can be used in lower gain configurations without compromising the phase margin. A technique known as noise gain shaping is commonly used when operating a decompensated amplifier in low gains or in attenuator configurations. See Reference Design TIDA522 to learn how to configure decompensated amplifiers such as the LMH5401 in gains lower than that specified in the datasheet. At this point, one may ask what are the benefits of a decompensated amplifier? A decompensated amplifier can achieve better dynamic performance without consuming any extra power, avoiding the typical amplifier design trade-offs between power and bandwidth. For example, the OPA656 and OPA657 are both built on the same process and share the same core design. However, the OPA656 is unity gain stable while the OPS657 is stable in gains of 7 or higher. Notice that while both amplifiers consume the same quiescent current, the OPA657 has superior bandwidth, noise, and slew rate performance compared to the OPA656. This concludes the loop gain and stability analysis of the FDA. Please take the quiz to test your knowledge.